Oh, hello. You've stumbled upon the Words Wise podcast, where we talk about all things philosophy. Tonight's episode is going to be about art. What is art? What are some examples of good and bad art? And what's the best art that you've seen? Please join me. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Words Wise Podcast. Thank you very much for being here today. My name is Joe DeVille. Jesse Wikowski. I'm Sequoia Fussell. Chadwick Raymer. So Sequoia is a longtime friend. He's been around as, since the beginning of time, as far as we're all concerned. And today's subject is art, the philosophy, the definition, what's the meaning? So let's just dive right in. Sequoia, do you want to start us off with a definition of what you consider to be art? Okay, so art for me, art has been a big part of my life, and uh, going all the way back to, I'd say high school or even earlier with Jesse Wachowski, we've been we've been uh, artists, and uh, just something about, I guess, the, the creative nature, art itself is pretty abstract. It doesn't necessarily add anything of value beyond the value that you give it, um, but it can very much uh, be a source of inspiration or pleasure in uh, all its different forms, be, be it painting, music, uh, sculpture, dance. You can apply art to a lot of things. And uh, I, I think its value is that it does, it creates a sense of, of joy in people. So that's, that's my opinion on art. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with all of that. I even I feel like I brought in art even more because there are things that everybody would consider art. Certainly painting and music, dance, all forms of art. But one of the things I think about with art is, to me, art is a process of creation. And also, that's, that's really the fundamental part of what art is. And related to creation, we're talking about a process of being better and growing in your process of creating. There's, and that includes mindfulness as well. So just using those definitions, I'm a firm believer that everything is art. We're talking breathing is an art, as long as you're doing it mindfully. Uh, eating is an art, as long as you're doing it mindfully. I picture some people are watching TV while they eat and they're just going through the motions, wolfing down the food and they're focused on something else. But an artistic eater would be somebody that sits there and they might plan out their meal. And that's the thing about art is it's about the process and everybody has their own way to do it. If I'm looking at a meal or a painting, I may, let's take a painting for example. I'm going to paint a mountain range. So you start with the background and you go through all the steps. Some artists, I don't know what it's going to be. I'm just going to start moving and putting stuff on the canvas and it will evolve as it goes. But both of those are mindful. So to me, that's an important part of art is mindfulness and uh, also the fact that you're always getting better at it. You're, you're working towards something else. Yeah, to chime in on that, um, yeah, I totally agree with that. That's kind of my view on art as well. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to define what is and what isn't art anymore, especially when you've got like the, the ideas of what we consider modern art. Um, you could put a, and I'm not a big proponent of modern art, but there are people who are literally put a pile of trash in the middle of the floor and call that modern art. So right. it's, uh, it's, I think what people are trying to express really, and like what you were saying to me, it's like a, a mindful creative expression of high potential. You know, it, it's what the person is trying to convey in, in their art form. And that's the potentialities of that creativity. So. Mm -hmm. I would even maybe bring it to a level even beyond that, where it's not only reliant upon the creator themselves, but also the viewer. So if someone's just building a fire out in the woods, they might, they might think of that as a completely utilitarian nature. But someone watching might see that as a beautiful fire or almost like a work of art. So, so, so it doesn't necessarily rely on the creator, but also the viewer, the critic, 
themselves. Wow, that's a good point. And um, I think it could even go beyond the human sphere, whereas sometimes a mountain range almost seems like our, uh, a bird making a nest. Again, because the person is looking at it and they're putting their own subjective idea. It's a idea beautiful, of complex creation. An anthill, even, or... But would you say it's only art because somebody is looking at it and calling it art? Was it art before somebody wow. looked at it? That, that's <laughs> like, the, does a tree falling in the woods make a sound kind of question. But um, I, I think it relies on both the viewed and the artists themselves. And separated, because the Egyptians made their art for the dead inside a pyramid, not thinking that there would be any living viewers at the same time, it's still art. Hmm. And then living viewers eventually came along and found it. Sure. I mean, I think it'd be argued too that maybe that's where art comes from, is just viewing nature in general, you know. Seeing things that inspire us, we, you know, would essentially start painting them on cave walls and so forth. Right. At the beginning, it was, it was our hands, and then they would spit pigment on it so that when it was done, there was a hand in the negative space. Right. So, I have a question then for you guys. Is there such a thing as good art and bad art? And what do you think the difference is? I think there's a, been a lot of studies on this. And I, I think it's, again, very subjective. You know, I really, I, that's my personal belief. But if you look at, like, um, a lot of the studies that have been done scientifically, then yes, if you're, if you're referring to aesthetics, then yeah, I think there is definitely, you know, a spectrum of what people would consider beautiful versus not. So, but again, that can be extremely subjective. Right, like your pile of trash in the floor thing. Right. Some people might right. really find some poignancy in that. Right, right, absolutely. I, I could definitely concede that. Yeah. Right. I do believe that all cultures relegate some people as having more skill in the area than others, which kind of goes to the good and bad category. So the more straight someone can draw a line or whatever the technique may be, that person is often um, termed the better artist, or maybe the best in the village, or whatnot. Was that Da Vinci's thing? Was it being able to draw a perfect circle with one hand? I, yeah, I, I guess the naked eye that. can't determine where he ends or stops a line or whatnot. It was yeah. also practiced amongst, like you know, the Zen masters too. If you could paint a perfect circle that was the ideal it's one of the in fact it's probably the most difficult thing to draw accurately is a, is a perfect circle so um, just, what do you think Sequoia I'm, I'm curious good art bad art if you yeah, was, on that. Um, it, it is very subjective but I, I could say we, we could say there is good art and bad art depending on level of skill and level of inspiration the amount of time someone Put into a project, or or the the uh, the years of practicing their craft. So on the one hand, you have skill, and then you also have inspiration. Is the subject matter something inspired? Is it something beautiful or aesthetically pleasing, or does it provoke thought? So there are levels um, to subjectively call art good or bad. So I could, we can say, yes, this is bad art, and that doesn't negate its value, but we, we can just say that's it. They didn't really have a great idea or put a lot of time. They just kind of, yeah, they, they painted a red splotch on a canvas, and <laughs> like that's not job. exactly a, a master of a craft, in right. a sense. So, yeah, good, there is good and bad work. Sure. It's the idea of calling something childish, so to speak, mm -hmm. sometimes, or... Right. Even cultures that didn't have the word art, they still knew who would probably be the best at painting their teepees or whatnot. Right. And that's why I prefer like Renaissance and classical art because it was always the idealized form. It was what is the most beautiful. What is in that that involved a, an incredible uh, ability of skill to be able to master. You know, especially when you got into the Baroque styles of realism and so forth. I mean, you have to have a lot of skill to be able to do that. So. When I think about good and bad art, to me, on one hand, if I, if I think I understand what the artist was trying to achieve, I would lean towards that's good art. If it's a really well-rendered picture of maybe a fox or something, and it's very lifelike, then I would consider that good art. At the same time, 
I saw this one picture. It was a piece of canvas painted pink, and it had a strip of duct tape in the center of it, and that was it. And I didn't know what what I was supposed to feel. And maybe that's what the artist really wanted. Mm -hmm. But my instinct when looking at that was, it's just not good art. And to me, the best kind of art is the ones that not only do you see the picture, but it actually creates some sort of emotional change in you. Right. If it's a scene of suffering or a scene of joy, and I actually feel joy when I see it, that I think is where it really becomes sublime. Right. And that can translate to music even, I would say, almost more so than a, a visual piece. Music, uh, a well-crafted piece of music that touches on emotions we feel or it, it, it can it can tell a story that just transports us immediately to that place. So music in that that form is definitely art and and definitely can, can transport us from our normal state of being into an emotional place or a joyous place or a dark place. And that brings up another interesting thing about art, because it's sort of, what is the intention of it? Is it for the artist and to just create, or is it for the viewer to achieve something? Because when I was talking about how eating and breathing is art, it's really not something that people are going to look at and feel like they're seeing a transcendent experience. But it literally is for the person that's performing the art. Right. I think that goes back to my Egypt statement where it depends. Some artists do it just for themselves. Some do it for the world. And I'm not even so sure, too, like we would, if the artist would do it for themselves so much as a compulsion. I think there's plenty of precedents for you know great artists to where they literally had to do what they did because it was a compulsion of theirs. You know, there's a lot of them that had you know obsessive compulsive disorders as well, where it was something that they had to get right. You know, the sort of perfection idea of, of what they're creating and it was really kind of outside the realm of like well i want to do this or doing it for somebody else it was a literal compulsion of theirs so hmm. it's i think in that sense too it's very subjective as far as the reasons why we create art is you know for a whole host of reasons i agree with jesse on that you know the viewer plays a huge role in that but at the same time though um, there's been plenty of artists who, or I think it's, it's more of a way of life that they have to live, uh, or she, in order to, uh, to do what they do. Journaling could be seen as a type of artwork, and that's only for yourself, maybe. You're not going to tell your journal to everybody at, at large, but you're practicing your writing art, right? Just for yourself. And it's mindful, yeah. Right. Good. So... Another question I want to ask you guys is what is something that you think of when you think of great art? What's what's something that is a favorite piece of yours? And I'll go first. I was at this gallery and it was a giant painting of a koi pond, I guess you could say, and there were carp in there just swimming around and it was sort of a bird's eye view of it and it was very well done. Beautiful pictures of carp swimming around and looked at that for a while and was walking around. After that, I, I looked at the picture across the room, and I saw that some of the carp were white, and some of them were white with black splotches on them, and they actually spelled out the word carpe diem in the picture, which philosopher Horace, it's his phrase saying, seize the day. And it was just such an amazing thing. I was looking at this picture for so long and really enjoying it, thinking I understood it, and later on seeing it from a whole nother light, Seize the day, such a powerful emotion in order to bestow just really an awesome piece of work. Uh, one of my favorite artists um, is the artist H.R. Geiger, who was the creator of the, uh, the Alien from the Alien movies. And uh, to me, not only is he a master of, of the skill of the craft, painting incredibly detailed, realistic looking imagery, it, it touches a place. It's very dark art. It's it's very almost horror-esque or creepy. He does the kind of biomechanoid um, shapes of alien or, yeah, biomechanical people. And it touches this, this place of unease and discomfort because it's just so well done and so creepy. It takes you to a, a dark place. And uh, I've always found a lot of value in more um, dark or upsetting um, 
work that can touch on a, a place that's a little uncomfortable without without burying you in it. Um, so to me, he's he's just a master of the craft. Uh, just really, and he's hundreds of works of just incredibly creepy, bizarre, uh, organic mechanical beings. So he's he's one of my favorites. I have to piggyback on that and say that I really like his work also. Uh, I'm not sure if it's Geiger or Gigar. If you guys know, let us know because I, you know I'm sure one of them is correct. But yeah. I always said Geiger also. Uh, the thing about him is he has normally two different colors, and so it's very much that chiaroscuro of dark and light. And the shading that he does in there, he really does create these. He can he can create depth in that, and it's the thing is he doesn't tend to normally use a lot of different colors, but boy, the work that he can project is awesome. I agree. Um, what am I? What I look for in art specifically it really captures my attention is the um, the light and the shadow play. So. If I if I'm looking at like a Rembrandt um, and he's doing like a, you know the waves of the ocean and light hitting those waves, and he's able to get the spray of you know the waves as they go up, and it, it almost looks like there's a light inside the painting. So to me, to be able to render that light and shadow is incredible and. Uh, the most uh, profound example of that that I've ever seen um, was when I was in Italy with Margaret and we went to um, the Vatican and there's uh, a painting done by Raphael, who's, I forget the saint's name, but it's a saint that's imprisoned and he's in his prison cell and like you're facing, it's a fairly large painting, probably like 12 by 15, uh, you know, fresco uh, of this saint behind the bars and the, you're you're facing the bars it's the first thing that you see so you're seeing him through the bars imprisoned and <clears throat> you get the impression that because there's an angel there in the cell with him that the light coming off of the angel is literally illuminating through the bars it was so profound and so amazing i've never seen anything like it uh and not only that, that the, the colors that he chose and, and the, the way that it looked as though there was an actual light emanating and that the bars became like a three-dimensional object. It was an amazing illusion that he had created, you know, with geometry and so forth and light play. So to me, I, I always uh, found that aspect of art, you know, fascinating is that because when you, when you get the, the lighting done just right, that's when you really do produce almost a three-dimensional effect. And to be able to do that is, I would imagine incredibly difficult. I'm going to give maybe the most generic response ever. Um, da Vinci, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, for me personally, he had probably one of the biggest influences, not only on a personal level, but he is debatably the inventor of the cartoon, revolutionized the portrait. Everybody talks about the light, dark, chiaroscuro shadow, and that was a term he coined. So just to, even with only 22 paintings, but thousands of sketches and note pages, he really in, captured the definition of Renaissance man or even artist to me. And to go off that, I'm taking from his notebooks a little, and we're going to um, segue into what is the greater art form? The painter, the visualist, or the writer? So this is from his notes, The Comparison of the Arts. If you know how to describe and write down the appearance of the forms, the painter can make them so that they appear enlivened with lights and shadows, which creates the very expression of the faces. Herein, you can attain with the pen, where he attains with the brush. And by pen, he men means writer, brush painter. Mm -hmm. So, wow. I, I kind of have two thoughts about that on as far as which is the greater a picture is worth a thousand words that pretty eloquently explains the view that the painter is the superior one in that way but at the same time the writer has a better opportunity to 
clarify the idea, to mm -hmm. force it. This is this is what I want you to think about. Right. And it really depends on the goal of the art. If the art is for the observer and it wants to tell a story, I'm not sure I know the answer. There's just two sides of the coin. Right. I, I, I do um, agree to that to a lot of a degree because basically the, the painting itself is silent. And in some cases it's meant to be, you know, it, it could convey those thousand words, but at the same time though, it doesn't convey enough because ultimately you have meaning in say the painting or the sculpture or whatever it is you're doing. Um, but in writing you have the defined meaning. So I'm not saying necessarily that that's always more important to do because like I said, you know, in some cases you want, like I'm not sure it was Da Vinci's, you know, uh, planned uh, to make the Mona Lisa, you know, known. Maybe that was his whole intent was to, to leave a question out there as to, well, what is she smiling about or is she smiling? Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that I think was intentional. Um, but if we, my, my point is, is that writing is much more profound in the sense, uh, as an art form, because without it, we wouldn't even know and be able to have the conversation based on his own notes about Da Vinci, because, you know, he wouldn't have written anything down and we wouldn't know exactly what his thoughts were on the subject. So that, in that sense, makes it a very profound thing because that, you know, carries through the ages. We can actually know his thought process and define him better. Whereas if we all we had were his paintings, we wouldn't know. So. I would say, siding with Da Vinci, art can be more universal, whereas writing is cultural. So if there's a drawing of... Um, a cloud or a tree mm -hmm. that can carry to almost all realms of human experiences whereas writing is only bound to that culture in and of itself right um, I can agree with that right and, and in general I agree with what Joe said about a picture's worth a thousand words I do believe there are some exceptions like say a haiku which is only 17 syllables mm -hmm. that could be worth a thousand pictures right but in general I think uh, Joe has it right I always thought that was a funny saying myself because um, you can look at a painting, sure, of, of say the Mona Lisa, but what is it really saying? Is it a thousand words, really? Because we don't really know what it's saying. And there are a lot of paintings that are that way, where it's even if it's a depiction of, like, say, a battle, um, we don't really know what battle it is. You know, it's not really conveying that. So I never really truly understood that that uh, that phrase personally in that context. But let's say like a cave painting in France, you know, of, a, of a, you know, an ancient uh, oryx or something like that. Well, we can glean from that that it was obviously some of somewhat of high intelligence and creativity who created it. But that's really all we know. Whereas if there was writing next to it, say for instance, then we would have a whole greater knowledge, I think, an expression of, of what that artist was trying to do. Just, you know, there's the beauty and the meaning associated with the art, but I think that writing will always give us that more defined meaning. So, and that, and that to me, in so many cases, I think is so much more important. And you're right, it is more universal in that sense, uh, and, and writing is more cultural, but without writing, we would not have those interactions of culture, I think. So I think that's really what's important. There's a clarity to writing. Yeah. You know, the, the idea is being explained. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there's a, in art, as visual art, it's about almost critical thinking because in writing you're being told what's going on and you could think critically about that. You can look right. outside of the, the lines the lines being the sentences in that situation. But looking outside of the lines in a picture, take the battle scene, you don't really know what's going on. But with a critical eye and critical thought, it's almost endless, the experience that you can have with that. You could see sure. one side as the victor fighting for good or the other side fighting for good, or maybe they're both right. evil. And maybe learn something about military strategy back in the day, just from 
how people were organized mm -hmm. in the phalanxes or whatever it was. True. But what if, think of it in this context, what if all we had of Plato was a bust of him? Mm. So, mm. I mean, if you think of it right. in that context, that's kind of, not to say that, you know, um, art is somehow limiting in its expression, but it is. Yeah. Ultimately. Well, and, they both are. Well, I would agree with that. But, like, I'm agreeing with Joe in the fact that it's, there's a clarity to be had. And if all we had was a bust of Plato, then that's a lot of expression that we're losing um, that's incredibly important. So I will always lean more towards writing as being the more important expression because we get more clarity from it and we learn more from it. We can get, I think, a lot more beauty of expression from art. But as far as like the import of it, I think it's always going to be right, in my opinion. Well, Plato was known specifically as a wordsman, whereas someone like Leonardo da Vinci, his art's going to capture him more than his words. Right, but we wouldn't know that unless he wrote it down. Not necessarily, because we still love the Mona Lisa, even without knowing his writings. Right, but we wouldn't know his very thoughts on that, though, had, he not, had you just not read that from that book. True, but like you also said, he didn't write anything about the Lisa, so, so to speak, about his meaning. Right, as far as that goes, yeah, but that was intentional, sure. But as far as like his specific you know, writings on art and writing, then if he had not written that idea down, we wouldn't know. So, And I think that's incredibly important. Well, here's an idea where I'm going to agree with you and then agree with Da Vinci. On the abstract level, and abstract art is more of a recent thing in a lot of levels, Writing probably beats painting on abstraction. So thought forms, philosophy, stuff like that, writing's better. But as far as getting the details of a face, it's better to draw it than to describe it with words. Oh, well, sure, absolutely. I would agree with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's to give at least both sides their due. Mm -hmm. But who the face belongs to and why and all these sorts of things. Yeah, without writing, we wouldn't know those things. So. And one thing that I think about that you were talking about, take that battle scene that you that you mentioned. The artist maybe didn't know anything really about war. He might the he or she may have just wanted to create a really chaotic, violent image. Right. And so we were gonna look at it and say, Oh, this was an ancient war and mm -hmm. try to put some sort of stuff on it that is all made up. Exactly. That's another point that I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually going to do the that very same thing is when you're looking at art, it's not always true to form. Mm. Much of it is idealized, or some of it is completely abstracted into falsehood. So, uh, for instance, Medici had many, you know, paintings done about them that were depicted, uh, you know, as uh, gods or Jesus Christ or in scenes of battles and stuff that were totally fictitious. Words can lie to you, though. Well, I'm not saying that they don't. But what I'm saying is, is that the expression that you're seeing is very subjective to not only the, the artist himself, but, you know, or herself, but also the commissioned, uh, the commissioner of the art. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Pope was very specific about what he had Michelangelo do. And so he, there wasn't a free reign for him to fully express his own ideas about what art is. So it was very much under the guidance of who commissioned it as well. So there's a certain amount of um, play in there as far as you know what it is you're actually saying. So when you're looking at that scene of the battle, it's a totally idealized you know uh, form of it. Whereas hundreds of years you know from that point, you know we're looking back at it going like, you know the impression is, is that this is what happened. You know so that brings up an idea that in the past um, art was used as a means of conveying information say these these images at the vatican huge um huge pieces showing religious or historical events was a means of conveying information when uh, at the time maybe everyone didn't know how to read so you, you saw this image and it showed you something about history or your religion yeah and then back to writing writing has become the modern or the modern way of conveying information and in that sense, writing can tell a huge story, whereas a painting no longer can adequately express um, as much of a story, as much of detail, or, or go into the author's uh, full creativity. 
And in a sense, that's a good thing about art because art doesn't need to have a purpose. So a mm -hmm. painting doesn't need to co convey that information. It's just exists and it's nice to look at and maybe it makes you feel a way. Maybe someone else feels a different way. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with that. Maybe in a modern sense also where we've been had the capability to combine the two, which is maybe almost the greatest of art forms where we have graphic novels, uh, comic books to right. movies yeah. where we're combining both language and visual right. and look, audio. Look at hieroglyphics. I mean, I mean, hieroglyphics is, you know, this pictorial writing, and, you know, in fact, uh, hieroglyphs were um, supposedly only understood by like, you know, the upper classes and the priests and so forth. And there was another form, the Coptic, you know, writing, which was you know, for everyday kind of people. But then again, there was very few that could actually read that in the first place. So, um, but in the idea of it, though, it's kind of interesting because here it is: we have pictures conveying lots of information, but you're also assigning a lot of information to those symbols. So, in that sense, uh, writing in and of itself, it's all really is pictures. You know, we're ascribing meaning to them. You know, these symbols. I was just about to say that writing is almost like the child of art. And it's, yeah. a, it's an art in its own self. It, it is in, a, in of its own form, yeah. And, and it's a pictorial uh, art as well, if you if you look at it that way, because we're essentially creating symbols that are essentially being put together in such a way to convey information that we... It's know, become so really utilitarian, but like something like cursive, even within our own language, English. Right. Um, it's described as very beautiful, flowing, artistic. Right. Not my cursive, but uh, right. Yeah. yeah, I don't think anyone's cursive anymore is that great. Uh, yeah, it's what is the medium medium being used to express? Are you uh, writing out your tax forms with this form of communication, or are we reading the Lord of the Rings? So it's a medium to express an infinite amount of ideas or creativity, or just to make your grocery list for the day. So it's it's got unlimited potential. Yeah. And that's why the person that is the artist at life, they're going to spend their time mindfully filling out their grocery list. Yeah, so right. <laughs> put some little curls at the end of the letters. <laughs> dot, dot every I with a heart. <laughs> so, everybody, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Words Wise podcast. What do you think? What do you think about art? What's your definition? What's good art? What's bad art? What's your favorite piece of art? We're curious to know, so you can leave comments, and please do. Also, please like and subscribe. And until we see you again, have a good one. Goodbye.